Welcome to lesson C14. In this lesson, you'll learn how to connect your Pi to other devices using a component called a relay. With proper wiring, a relay can control, allow your Pi to control whether another device is powered on, powered off, or depending on the type of device, you can actually control other functionality as well. In this video, we'll look at the mechanical construction and input coil current for relays, as well as go over the different types of relays. And then we'll talk through the relay carrier board and how to drive a relay. A relay is an electronic component that operates somewhat like a transistor. So a relay will allow a small input signal to control a larger output signal. Now, a transistor can be fully on, fully off, or any level in between, but a relay is different. It can only be on or off. And this makes relays a great choice for controlling power to equipment. So relays can be found in refrigerators, thermostats, automobiles, and many other electronic devices we interact with on a daily basis. Another feature of a relay is that the input signal and the output signal are not electrically connected. And this means that you can have a low power device like the Raspberry Pi control a larger device that might even be running on AC wall power. And this is due to the internal construction of relays, which we'll discuss here shortly. But before we do that, never attempt to connect electronic circuits to high voltage or AC wall power. The voltage levels present in those systems can cause harm or death if improperly connected. So I'm very serious, don't do this, very dangerous. Relays operate using the properties of electromagnetism. A small coil of wire is energized, which causes it to become temporarily magnetized. This coil will then attract a magnet that's attached to an arm that moves inside the relay. A connector called common is connected to the magnetic arm. When the relay is at rest with no energy flowing through the input coil, there'll be a path for current to flow between the common and normally closed connection. Now, when the input coil is energized, magnetic attraction will cause the arm to be drawn toward the coil, causing the arm to make contact with the normally open connection. The normally open connection is by far the most common use or most common to use for power control applications. So a device controlled by a relay would generally have its input power wired through the normally open and common connections of a relay. When the input with the input coil unpowered, the LED circuit is not complete, so the LED will not light. When the input coil is energized, the relay arm will be magnetically drawn toward the coil causing it to connect with the normally open terminal. The LED circuit now has a complete path from the positive battery terminal through the relay contacts, through the resistor, the LED, and back to the battery. As you can see from the circuit above, there are no shared signals or voltage levels between the input coil and any of the components on the output side. No voltage will be transferred between the input side and the output side since the relay control happens through magnetism. And since there is no electrical connection between the two sides, the input and output circuits are said to be isolated from each other. This means a small five volt transistor can be used to drive the input coil while the output connections could be controlling a 120 volt AC circuit that's drawing 10 amps of current. Now, in this example, the small 5 volt transistor will not be damaged by the 120 volt 10 amp circuit that it's controlling. The input coil is just a coil of wire that's positioned near the magnet of the relay arm. Now, the wire used for the coil is like one of your jumper wires, but the coil wire is very tiny so that many turns of the wire can be packed into a really small space. The problem with this wire, though, is that it has almost no resistance. This characteristic is great when you wanna connect two components together, but it can become a problem when you wanna drive a component like a speaker or a relay that's made up of just a coil of wire. The coil of wire will generally have very low resistance and will act almost like a short circuit when it's driven. An amplifier is required when driving a speaker, but a simple transistor can be used for driving the input coil or a relay. The specifications for the voltage levels required to energize and hold the relay are referred to as the pickup dropout voltage. So pickup voltage is the amount of voltage that's required to make the arm inside the relay swing from the resting position to the energized position. And the dropout voltage is the amount of voltage that's required to hold the arm in that energized position. Okay, so here are the specifications for the relay included in your kit. 
Due to the low resistance value of the coil, the coil can take a considerable amount of current to drive. In the case of the relay included in your kit, it will take 60 to 70 milliamps to energize the relay. A GPIO pin can only supply a maximum of 16 milliamps, so a transistor should always be used to provide a higher current drive for that relay coil. The transistor will do the work of energizing the coil with only low current and on and off commands coming from your GPIO pin. The relay we looked at in the previous section is called, in the, with the diagrams, was called an EMR or electromechanical relay. And this is because this type of relay contains an arm that mechanically changes positions between multiple contacts. You'll usually hear a loud click when an EMR is activated. And you've probably heard this click actually from the thermostat in your house before. The loud click is the sound of the electrical contacts inside the relay coming into contact with each other when the relay switches from resting to energized or back again. Another type of relay is called an SSR, which is a solid state relay. It has no moving parts. Switching on and off this type of relay is possible due to the electrical properties of the chemicals used inside the relay. And since there are no moving parts inside an SSR, there will be no clicking sound when the relay switches between states. Current handling is another way these types of relays are different. So EMRs can generally handle large amounts of current due to the size and construction of the contacts inside the device. SSRs are often more compact in size and can only handle a fraction of the current an EMR can handle. Okay, EMRs are very common, so and they're reasonably inexpensive. SSRs though are not commonly used and they tend to be much more expensive to add to a project. All right, input current is also an area where these two differ. An EMR requires a significant amount of input current to magnetically attract that little contact arm and hold it into place. An SSR though needs very little current to energize and hold the relay. All right, and finally, a big difference potentially would be a reliability difference. Solid state relays have the advantage they have no moving parts, so the reliability is going to generally be much better, but let's put this in perspective for a minute, given the types of projects you'll be working on. So even though an SSR is more reliable, most EMRs like what you'll be working with are rated to withstand somewhere between 100,000 and 1 million contact events. So that's gonna be more than enough for most projects. But if you get in a situation where a relay is going to be actuated very often, then a higher quality EMR and SSR might be a better fit for that particular project. Now, the information in the previous sections refer to the relay component itself, but the relay in your kit is already mounted to a circuit board, and this circuit board contains the relay, a few components that help keep connected devices safe, status LEDs, and connectors for making the wiring connections to the circuit board. So here on the left are the locations of the signals on the connectors and the status LED. Now, the normally closed, normally open, and common connections are connected directly to the output side of the relay, and their functions have been covered in previous sections when we talked about mechanical construction. Now, here are the other features on the board, and I'm gonna give you a brief explanation for each of these. Okay, so VCC, that's the five volt power input to the relay carrier board, all right? Ground is the ground connection, of course, to the relay carrier board. IN is the input control line to the carrier board. The relay will be off if higher floating and the relay will be on if the input control line is grounded. Next we have power LED, that's the LED that will turn on if the relay carrier board has five volt input power present. And then finally we have the relay status LED. Now this LED will indicate the current state of the relay. If the LED is off, it means that the relay is at rest and the normally closed and common relay output lines are connected. The LED on means that relay is energized and that the normally open and common relay output lines are now connected. When connecting to normally closed, common, and normally open on the output side of the relay, the connector is equipped with screw terminals for securing the connections. Now, a small Phillips or flathead screwdriver can be used to loosen or tighten those screws. And loosening the screw will open up the connector, while tightening the screw will cause the connector to clamp down on the wire or pin that's inserted. 
and this type of connector can clamp down on bare wires or male pins equally well. But some caution should be used if you're trying to clamp, if when you're clamping onto male pins, as the pins could become damaged if the clamping screws are over tightened. So just be a little bit careful there. Okay, now a few minutes ago, I mentioned that the current required to drive the low resistance input coil could damage a GPIO pin if connected directly. So a transistor will need to be used to drive the relay coil. Here's a basic transistor circuit that you'll be using in the activity section of this lesson to drive the input coil of the relay. A GPIO pin will be connected to the base of an NPN transistor. The collector of the transistor will be connected to the IN connection of the relay and the emitter will be connected to ground. When the GPIO pin is low, the transistor will not turn on and the ground from the emitter will not be connected to the collector. This will cause the relay inline to keep floating, keeping the relay off. If the GPIO pin is pushed high, the high on the base will cause the transistor to turn on and this will allow the ground from the emitter to connect to the collector. When the relay carrier board senses a low or ground on the relay inline or IN line, then the relay will turn on. And as soon as the GPIO pin goes back low, ground will be removed from the relay IN line and the relay will turn off. Okay, before you move on to the activities for this lesson, let's take a few minutes and go over the concepts we've just discussed. First, a relay is an electrical component that allows a small input signal to control a much larger output signal. Relays operate using electromagnetism and there are no shared signals or voltage levels between the input coil and the output side, meaning the relay con control happens through magnetism. The input coil has almost no resistance and so there's a danger of it acting like a short circuit. A transistor can be used though to drive that input coil of a relay and you'll get a chance to do that in the activities for this lesson. Now, there are two common types of relays, electromechanical and solid state. The EMRs are less costly and more common, although the SSRs can be more reliable if you're in a high use situation. The relay carrier board in your level C kit contains the relay, a few components that will keep connected devices safe, status LEDs and connectors for making those wiring connections to the circuit board. Okay, go ahead and move on to the activities for this lesson where you'll get some hands-on practice using the relay.